Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Stanford University and Strong Medicine. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing acute decompensated heart failure. This is a huge topic, and in order to keep the video relatively brief, I'll be discussing only the most important clinical points an intern needs to know, and I'll be making the assumption that you, the viewer, have already a med student level knowledge of heart failure, including how it presents. Let's start with a few important definitions, which often get confused. Heart failure. What is it? It's a clinical syndrome, one characterized by signs and symptoms of either low cardiac output and or fluid overload. A cardiomyopathy is a pathologic diagnosis, specifically a disease of the myocardium. There is some disagreement with the term between its formal definition and the definition in common use. Formally, professional societies currently define a cardiomyopathy to be a disease in the absence of coronary artery disease, hypertension, or valvular disease. However, in common usage, clinicians often use the term ischemic cardiomyopathy to refer to impaired myocardial function due to coronary artery disease, usually the consequence of prior infarctions. And they use the term non-ischemic cardiomyopathy to refer to any other cause besides coronary disease. So is ischemic cardiomyopathy a misnomer? I don't know. With apologies to the pathologists, I don't think it's an answered question. And then there is left ventricular systolic dysfunction, which is nothing more than the echocardiographic finding of a low ejection fraction. These three things often coexist, but not always. There are patients with clinical signs of heart failure, but with normal systolic function. There are patients who have a cardiomyopathy, but no symptoms or overt signs. All seven combinations are possible. When developing a differential diagnosis for a patient presenting with symptoms of heart failure, there are actually two differential diagnoses to generate. The differential for the patient's baseline chronic heart failure, or their cardiomyopathy, and the differential for their current exacerbation. They can be the same etiology, or they can be completely different. The most common etiology of chronic heart failure in the United States is coronary artery disease. Other common causes include hypertension, valvular heart disease, alcohol, illicit drugs, particularly amphetamines and cocaine, chronic lung disease, which leads to isolated right heart failure, tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy, which a tachyarrhythmia that's persistent for weeks or months leads to decreased systolic function, myocarditis, most commonly viral, and idiopathic. Common etiologies of acute decompensated heart failure include new ischemia, including acute coronary syndrome, new arrhythmias, particularly AFib, concurrent infections, acute illicit drug use, medication non-adherence, dietary non-adherence, and medication side effects, for example, NSAIDs and steroids, both of which lead to fluid retention, and the excessively rapid uptitration of beta blockers, which is relatively uncommon, but iatrogenic and largely preventable. Whenever you admit a patient with acute decompensated heart failure, it's critical to identify and address the proximal cause, for example, revascularization of patients with ischemia, or cardioverting a patient whose exacerbation was triggered by new onset AFib. The most common way to classify heart failure is based upon whether or not the heart's systolic function, specifically the ejection fraction, is compromised. In older terminology, failure was called either systolic or diastolic heart failure. However, this is a misnomer since any heart that experiences systolic dysfunction also experiences at least some degree of diastolic dysfunction. So starting around 2008, cardiologists began referring to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, abbreviated HEFREF, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or HEFPEF. The medical literature has reported that about one-third to one-half of inpatient admissions for heart failure are due to HEFPEF, while in my personal experience, it's a bit lower than that, but still a significant fraction of patients. While HEFREF versus HEFPEF is the most common way to categorize chronic heart failure, a wonderful way to categorize acute exacerbations is according to the volume and temperature paradigm. In this model, patients' intravascular volume status is determined to be either wet, implying high left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or dry, meaning euvolemic, 
or theoretically dehydrated. And they are also described as either cold, meaning low cardiac output, or warm, meaning normal cardiac output. Importantly, this model does not apply as well to isolated right side at failure and doesn't apply at all to so-called high output heart failure. The symptoms, signs, and test abnormalities observed in heart failure can be attributed to either the volume overload or the low output. Volume overload leads to the symptoms of dyspnea or thopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, lower extremity edema, and weight gain. On exam, it can lead to hypoxemia, crackles, a third heart sound, the murmur of functional mitral regurgitation from stretching of the mitral annulus, elevated JVP, peripheral edema, abdominal jugular reflux, and a dilated and non-collapsing IVC on ultrasound. And overload leads to an elevated BNP. In contrast, low cardiac output leads to symptoms of fatigue and anorexia, signs of tachycardia, narrow pulse pressure, cold extremities, poor capillary refill, and when particularly low, confusion. Low cardiac output can also lead to an elevated lactate. From this two by two table, we have four possible states a patient with heart failure can be in. If they are warm and dry, they are well compensated and hopefully asymptomatic. The most common phenotype among patients with acute decompensated heart failure is warm and wet, meaning volume overloaded with normal or near normal cardiac output. Cold and wet patients are next most common. And cold and dry is the least common. These categories are very helpful in understanding approaches to treatment, which I'll come back to in a minute. Before that, one way to classify heart failure treatment that's relatively specific to HEF-REF is to categorize medications by those which primarily affect hemodynamics and those which lead to neurohormonal blockade, with some overlap between the categories. The primary goal of those affecting hemodynamics is an improvement in short-term mortality, meaning these are the meds that are more important during acute decompensated heart failure. They are titrated to improve symptoms and to achieve specific hemodynamic goals, such as lowering blood pressure, increasing urine output, and decreasing JVP. When they're used, we intend to meet those goals within minutes to days, depending on the specific med and the urgency of the situation. Examples of meds in this category, loop diuretics, such as furosemide, nitrates, hydralazine, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, and inotropes. Despite strong consensus that these meds are beneficial in heart failure exacerbations, the quality of evidence supporting their use to improve symptoms and short-term mortality is relatively low. In the other category, meds which lead to neurohormonal blockade, these are intended to improve long-term mortality and are more important in chronic management. The meds are gradually uptitrated to achieve doses shown in clinical trials to lead to mortality benefit. In other words, we continue to slowly increase the dose even if the patient is feeling well and vitals are normal. We only stop uptitrating when the goal dose is met or the patient develops side effects from too much medication, at which point we back off a little. It can take weeks to months to meet titration goals. Examples of meds which lead to neurohormonal blockade include beta blockers, ACEs and ARBs again, aldosterone antagonists such as spironolactone, and neprilysin inhibitors, of which only one is FDA approved as of 2019, Sacubitril. The general quality of evidence supporting these meds is relatively high. In addition to medications, for patients with advanced refractory heart failure, there are also mechanical devices, such as an intraaortic balloon pump, a left ventricular assist device, abbreviated LVAD, and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, abbreviated ECMO. And there are electrical devices, such as a BIV pacemaker used to deliver cardiac resynchronization therapy, and an implantable cardioverter defibrillator for either primary or secondary prophylaxis against ventricular arrhythmias. Of the devices, only the mechanical ones are placed emergently. Patients need to be relatively hemodynamically optimized in order to be considered potential candidates for either an ICD or BIV pacemaker. Now, let's return to our 2x2 two two table of wet versus dry and cold versus warm and discuss how treatment is different in each of these four categories of heart failure. Once again, this model excludes isolated right-sided failure and high output failure. And when talking specifically about treatment, 
we will also be excluding heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The easiest category is the warm and dry, also known as compensated heart failure. Patients here should have their norohormonal blockade meds gradually uptitrated to target doses as tolerated. Warm and wet patients are also relatively straightforward, with treatment focusing on loop diuretics to improve preload and vasodilators to improve afterload. Cold and dry patients represent a bit of a challenge as they are the one subtype of decompensated heart failure who won't be helped with diuresis. One thing that can be considered for the acute patient is a small fluid bolus in the event that he or she has been overdiuresed. And by small, I mean 250 to 500 milliliters at most. And it carries the real risk of making an unstable patient even worse, so be very cautious and do this only in consultation with a cardiologist or other physician with some expertise in managing heart failure. Other treatments for the cold, dry patient include inotropes, specifically dobutamine, dopamine, and milrinone, and if refractory to inotropes, mechanical support. In my opinion, the cold, wet patients require the most nuance to treat. If a cold, wet patient has a systolic blood pressure that's relatively high, as in greater than 90, treatment should focus on short-acting vasodilators and loop diuretics, and if refractory to that, employ inotropes. Whereas if the systolic pressure is below 90, treatment should focus on inotropes and loop diuretics first. You can consider decreasing the dose of pre-existing vasodilators, but keep in mind that patients with advanced heart failure often do best with blood pressures that in other situations would seem really low. And once again, if the patient fails to improve with that, mechanical support is the only remaining option. If not already obvious, every cold dry patient and debatably, every cold, wet patient requires ICU or CCU level care. I'll now discuss some more specific pearls about monitoring and individual treatments. When it comes to telemetry, it's appropriate for the first 24 to 48 hours of an admission for acute decompensated heart failure, but it can usually be subsequently discontinued if the patient has been improving, is hemodynamically stable, and is without significant arrhythmias. While being actively diuresed, potassium and magnesium should be monitored at least once daily. There is no absolute rule about what is the most appropriate way to monitor the effectiveness of diuresis. Options include measuring ins and outs, daily weights, serial JVP, continuous CVP via a central line, assessing symptoms of volume overload, and IVC appearance on ultrasound. All of these have differing levels of practicality and accuracy, and it's probably best to not rely only on one single metric. Let's talk diuretics. All patients requiring diuretics should receive them as promptly as possible and in IV form. Furosemide, also known as Lasix, is the most commonly used loop diuretic, but bumetanide, marketed as Bumex, and torsamide have more reliable bioavailability. For diuretic naive patients, the most common starting dose in acute decompensated heart failure is furosemide, 20 to 40 mg IV, though patients with renal impairment often require higher doses. For patients already on an outpatient loop diuretic, the typical starting dose after presenting with an acute exacerbation is twice their usual outpatient dose of their usual outpatient medication. If there is minimal or no response to the first dose given, usually the dose is then doubled and tried again. A frequent issue that comes up with dosing diuretics is how to convert between an IV form and an oral form, and how to convert from one diuretic to another. Unfortunately, different references are not in complete agreement with this, but this table here is the closest to a consensus. So 80 milligrams of oral furosemide is approximately equal to 40 milligrams of IV furosemide, one milligram of bumetanide, either oral or IV, and 20 milligrams torsamide, either oral or IV. For patients who are non-responsive to escalating doses of IV loop diuretics, the addition of an IV thiazide, such as chlorothiazide, marketed as diuril, 30 minutes before each loop diuretic dose may help. As far as I know, there's no evidence for this practice, but it's very common. And if there is still inadequate response to diuretics, ultrafiltration is another option to consider.
What should we do with a patient's beta blocker when they are admitted with heart failure? If the exacerbation is mild in severity, continue the outpatient dose. If it's moderate, consider decreasing the dose or holding the med. And if severe, definitely hold it. The distinction between mild, moderate, and severe is of course subjective and arbitrary. Before up titration or resumption of a beta blocker being held, the patient should be at or very close to euvolemia. And when starting a beta blocker for the first time in a patient with HEFREF, or if they've been off it for a while, start at the lowest dose. For example, carvedilol 3.125 mg twice daily and up titrate slowly. Although ACEs and ARBs have better long-term outcome data in heart failure, for acute exacerbations, hydralazine plus nitrates may be safer and allow for more rapid up titration of afterload reduction. Hydralazine plus nitrates also do not lead to the mild increase in creatinine seen with ACEs and ARBs, which can confound titration of a diuretic. When starting any vasodilator in heart failure, start at the lowest dose. And remember, as mentioned already, patients with advanced heart failure tolerate and often do better with unusually low blood pressures. Hold parameters for your vasodilators may need to be adjusted downward to prevent the patient from having every dose held. Regarding non-pharmacologic therapies, only provide supplemental oxygen if the patient is hypoxemic. There is growing evidence that patients in a variety of clinical situations experience worse outcomes when given excessive amounts of oxygen. If a patient is in moderate to severe respiratory distress from pulmonary edema, strongly consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, specifically BiPAP. Salt restriction may be beneficial to volume overloaded patients in the first days of hospitalization. However, prior to discharge, consider switching to a diet containing the patient's usual salt and fluid intake to better estimate the appropriate outpatient diuretic dose. Although it is a near universal expert opinion that low salt diets help heart failure patients, the one existing randomized control trial of which I'm aware that looked at combined salt and fluid restriction in acute exacerbations found there to be no benefit from it. A word about BNP. Although in clinical practice, BNP levels are more commonly measured to help with diagnosis than with prognosis, the literature suggests that BNP is more helpful as a prognostic marker, specifically when measured serially. If the BNP has not decreased between admission and discharge, the patient may be discharging too soon. They have an increased risk of readmission, they may require closer outpatient follow-up, and they have an increased need for follow-up with a heart failure specialist. And I'll end with a quick pearl about presenting a patient with heart failure during hospital rounds. It can be very helpful to explicitly categorize treatment as inotropy, diuresis, afterload reduction, neurohormonal blockade, and education and risk factor modification. For example, for treatment of the patient's heart failure, Regarding inotropy, we uh, have successfully weaned off dobutamine last night, and the patient seems to be tolerating that fine. For diuresis, we are continuing the furosemide IV 40 milligrams twice daily, and we're aiming for an INO goal of being net negative 1 to 1.5 liters by tomorrow morning. For afterload reduction, we um, have transitioned her from hydrology nitrates over to an ACE inhibitor, uh, several days ago, and today we are up titrating that lisinopril from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams. For neurohormonal blockade, we're still holding off on the beta blocker for now while she's still a little bit hypervolemic, but we hope to be able to start carvedilol in about two to three days. And for education and risk factor modification, she's uh, continuing on a low salt diet, and the heart failure nurse practitioner will be meeting with her today to uh, do some motivational interviewing to try to work on her medication adherence. That's it for this video on acute decompensated heart failure. Remember to like and share it if you found it helpful. Thanks for watching.